Psalm 73, uh, it's, a, it's a huge blessing to be in this um, psalm today. Um, it really helps with redirecting our focus, and I think that we really need that today, at least I do, um, regarding recent events. And, you know, in our world today, you know, it, it, the scriptures clearly teach that things are going to get worse and worse morally in, as before we get come to the second coming of Christ. And we're told that good will be referred to evil and evil will be referred to as good, that many of the, the, the um, institutions will be uh, not, not doing what God would want them to do, but to basically be corrupted because all these institutions, unfortunately, I mean, by their very nature, they are um, headed up by, by flawed people and sinful people. Uh, and so, the, you know, sometimes we can get really discouraged and, it, and, and we can see certain things in the, in the world and in the culture that really bums us out, that really gets us discouraged. And sometimes it seems like there's no end in sight and there's injustice going around in the world. And it's easy to forget that God sees all of it. It matters to him. He intervenes more than we realize in situations. We have no idea what he spares us from and spares people from uh, any given day. Uh, and and we are coming to you know as as the kind of God wraps all this up. There's really specific prophetic things that God has revealed that are going to happen, uh, and we see clear evidence of that happening in this world. Uh, and as you study Scripture, as you study prophecy, you start to see that you know of course God knew everything that was going to happen, and He told us so much of. Uh, what's going to happen for us to discover and learn, not just for us to have information, but to prepare our hearts to have the right heart posture or the right attitude or the right way to process that information. And so uh, it, he wants to use his word and an encouragement uh, to help us. Now, related to Christians, this because this world, as I said, is getting worse and worse in so many ways. But as Christians, we love the world, uh, the, the Lord, and we want to do what's right. And we have the, the ways of this world, our sinful nature, and demonic forces that are against us. We deal with all the other trials that everyone else deals with, but we also, on top of that, deal with those things. But God supernaturally compensates, and God supernaturally helps us. He uses all things, He works all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. And He doesn't waste anything in making us more like Himself as we yield to Him. So we want to do what's right, and we're not perfect. We're growing. We're flawed people. We fall short every day, uh, but God is patient with us, and He's, he, you know, here we are trying to play by the rules, so to speak. We're trying to do what's right, and 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 sometimes we're not rewarded for doing what's right. Sometimes we're persecuted for doing the right thing, and sometimes we can think that uh, if I just do the right thing, if I just have the right motive, then the right outcome is going to happen. But it doesn't always happen that way, because sinful man's involved in situations. And so we can get really discouraged. It could drive us crazy at times. And so what I want us to see this morning, what, this, what the psalm clearly teaches is that that's nothing, that, that whole cycle of trying to do the right thing, uh, having, trying to do what God wants us to do, then seeing the world be how it is, and then seeing that uh, there's, there's um, people that seem like they're getting away with things that are wicked, and, and we get, can get discouraged, that's not new. That's happened throughout the history of God's people. You know, and we can look at it, we can ask the question, you know, this is a common question, especially with unbelievers, why do good things ha- or bad things happen to good people? And we struggle with that. And that's a whole other st- study. But today, with, related to Psalm 73, the question becomes, why do good things happen to bad people? Why, do, why does it and there's different times where psalmists and different gospel writers, or not gospel writers, but Bible writers struggle with the prosperity of the wicked. God defines the wicked. We don't define the wicked. He defines the wicked. And sometimes we see them prospering as far as our vantage point. And it can be really discouraging because we can think, you know, what good does me doing the right thing what good is that? Is that if, if people that are ungodly and doing the wrong thing and are violating God's word seem to prosper? So that's the question here, and, and we will dig into that. Psalm 73 was written by a man named Asaph. He was a Levite, 
And he was an organizer and leader of the tabernacle choir in the days of David. And most people believe into Solomon's reign who came after him. We're told in 1 Chronicles chapter 25, verses 1 and 2, that he uh, was one who prophesied according to the order of the king. He wrote Psalm 73 through 83. He also wrote Psalm 50. He was a very prolific uh, psalm writer. And in doing all of this, Asaph served in leading God's people in worship. And that's noteworthy because even those who are closest to the Lord, who lead God's people, they can get discouraged and they can have their perspective altered uh, despite their close relationship with God, just like anybody else. They struggle with the same things. They can have their perspective skewed and all of that. And so they need to be redirected. And they need to have their, their, their focus put in the right place once again. Because the reality of, of what's happening in, in the world and how people um, function in the world and the things that people do, it's very real and it affects all of us. The outline of Psalm 73 is, the, is, is thus. Verses 1 through 3, Asaph expresses the apparent contradiction between the goodness of God and the prosperity of the wicked. Verses 4 through 12, Asaph describes what appears to be an accurate description of the wicked. Verses 13 through 16, Asaph describes his false conclusions, which originate from his distorted perspective. Verses 17 through 20, he finally gets God's perspective of the wicked. And verses 21 through 28, he breaks out into worship as a result of believing God's perspective. Just like now, we, we just, we've just worshiped the Lord so so many of us have had our perspectives change, our hearts change, our minds refreshed. I love the prayer that Pastor Mike prayed at the beginning of the service, you know, and we need that. See, the presence of the Lord, God's word, God's people, all of that is designed in part to change our perspective. To I mean, I don't know about you, but there are so often I have this one set of circumstances. I take time to seek him to seek the Lord, to go to his word. And all of a sudden, it seems entirely different. Even though it's the same set of circumstances, it hasn't changed. But the way that I am filtering those circumstances, the way that I'm seeing those circumstances has absolutely changed. Only God can do that. And I love that he does it. He loves to do it. And, and he gets joy out of helping us. And so I think it's appropriate for us to look at this psalm and to be able to see this this worship leader, this person that's close to the Lord, go through this process and be able, be able to basically see it as a case study. So let's start in verse one. He says, truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So in verse one, he affirms the goodness of God and those who, who with a pure heart know it, he affirms that the goodness of God. And, and we struggle sometimes with what God allows wicked people or people that don't know Christ to experience and to um, go through. And then the goodness of God leads to repentance. And the cross, as people learn about the cross, they're drawn to God. And, 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 people, you know, God blesses people to a point, but he uses all those blessings. He wants to use all those blessings to get them to look at the source of those blessings and to recognize that those things are clearly from God. James wrote that every good and perfect gift comes from above. And, and when you know the giver of the gift, anything that's good that happens in life, um, it, you can enjoy it so much more because you know that it's from him. I've said this a few weeks ago, I forget what context, it was a, it was a midlife pre-senior moment, but uh, I was saying that how horrible would it be to be there on Christmas morning and not know who all those gifts are from, you know, but the fact that you know who they're from means so much more. And God wants us to know as we grow in our relationship with him, how he has meant certain things for us to bless us. And, and it's easy to forget that he is trying to draw people that don't know him to himself through different means. Now, when he says in verse two that his feet almost stumbled and his steps nearly slipped, this is not hyperbole. This is not, this is not I mean, it is poetic verses, not like he's rock climbing or whatever, you know, but it, it's, it's very real. You know, he, he's talking about 
the danger that was there because of his limited perspective. And his, when he sees and when we see the prosperity of the wicked, um, it's easy to be stumbled, but also it's easy to be envious and, and think that I want that. And there's something called selfish ambition, the, the scriptures talk about, where we can use ungodly means to get things that, we sh- that God doesn't have for us. And, and part of growing as a believer is learning what he has for us and what he doesn't have for us. What are the things he means for us to enjoy and to have and what things are not for us. And he's very faithful by his Holy Spirit to speak to us and say, that's not for you. That will stumble you or that's, that's not according. That'll, that'll be an imp- impediment to what I want to do in your life. So we, we look at this and go, why, why, is it, why does this person get this, whatever it is? And we know that it's a good thing. We know that God is good, and we know that, uh, that he loves to bless people. But when we see other people that are, that are not following him or not serving him, we can get um, uh, jealous, we can get envious, and, you know, it's easy. We can get passed up for a promotion. We can, you know, why does this person... You know, I'm trying to do the right thing in my family, but people take the side of this person that's not doing right, you know, and God seems to be blessing this certain person that, that we don't feel like they deserve it. And we have to be careful with that because do we really want justice, you know, in the truest sense? Because if we wanted justice, what, where would we be? You know, when we think about what we deserve, be careful about asking for what we deserve because you have to look very closely at what we really deserve being sinful, being fallen, uh, and having natures that are contrary to uh, God's word. Um, So it can stumble us and we can think I'm doing what's right. It doesn't really get me anywhere. Why should I do what's right anymore? What's it, what's it getting me? Well, what it's getting you is pleasing God. And that's the most important thing is to please God. God is looking at our lives. He's looking at our thoughts. He's looking at our motives our behavior, what's going on inside of us, it matters to him. And one of the ways that we can worship him is by obeying what he has said. So um, he knows that we need his perspective. Now, in verses 4 through 12, Asaph gives his description of the wicked. Some of it's accurate, some of it's skewed, some of it's um, not accurate. Look at verse 4. He says, for there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. Really? Really? I mean, no pangs in their death ever. There's no, there's nothing that's, that, and it's like, it just shows you kind of, and again, the Bible is really real with, with recording man's perspective. And there are things that man says in God's word that God doesn't, is not behind in the sense of truth, but he lets people share those things so we can see his working in their lives. So he says there, but their strength is firm. And especially when you're feeling weak, you can definitely think that others are completely strong. Verse five: They are not, they are not in trouble as other men, not, uh, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace; violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. What does that look like? <laughs> their eyes bulge, you know, like. Like you're, you're, what you have is so plentiful. You're just like, your eyes are bugging out because you're, you know, you're shocked or you're looking at um, the abundance there. It says they have more than the heart could wish. I don't know. The heart could wish a lot. Heart can wish a lot. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. It's such poetic language here, but it's so potent. It's so strong when we see that he's saying, look at what they're saying. Look what, look what their mouth is speaking evil against, the beauty that they're speaking against. Verse 10, therefore, as people return here and waters of a full cup are drained by them, and they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. Really? Always at ease? No, they're not always at ease. Um, they increase in riches. And so he's, he's, he's talking about these people that are boastful, that are proud, that are speaking against the things of God, speaking against God. They're waiting for the, their world to come. He, this Asaph is waiting for their world to come crashing down on them. 
to be able to, to say these things, to do these things, to have all this abundance, to be speaking loftily, to, to be boasting and, and you know, wearing pride like a necklace, just being so boastful and so proud. Surely he's thinking their lives are just going to cave in on themselves. They're going to implode any moment, but they, but they don't. At least as soon as, as they, Asaph thinks that it should. And so, again, this, this is exaggeration here. He's, he's being emotional. A lot of times when we're being emotional, we're not all that logical, accurate, reasonable. We're, we over, um, we're sharing over what the reality is here. And so, again, this is all covering, this is all an expression, all an overflow of Asaph's limited perspective. He doesn't see what happens in their lives. He doesn't see their concerns. He doesn't see what they're going through, what they agonize over, what they're secretly, um, you know, wanting deliverance from. But even if those things are true to a point, eventually there's going to be a reckoning. There's going to be a time of settling up. There's going to be a time of reaping what you sow. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So, God can be as gracious as, as he decides to be. It rains on the just and the unjust, we're told. That's an expression of blessing. God, God has it rain and, and provides and all these things. But there comes a time where you have to, quote unquote, pay the piper. There has, there's going to be a time where people will reap what they sow. And we have, to, we have to know that. We have to believe that. And honestly, most of the time, we're usually putting our nose where it shouldn't be when we're thinking about other people. And, and God has a really good uh, way of redirecting us and saying, you're putting your nose where it doesn't belong right now. Uh, focus on what I'm doing with you. So it can be really discouraging and even depressing seeing the wicked prosper. And, and again, we have a, a limited perspective. It can really affect us and, and we can come to some false conclusions that, that are not reality. And that's why it's so important that we have God's perspective in the situation. God's perspective. God knows their end. He knows what he's going to do with them. He knows what's going to happen. And we need to, we need to uh, be careful against these conclusions. But he starts these, these false conclusions uh, in verse 13. He says, Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. So why do what's right? Why do all these things? Where is it? What is it getting me? We have to be careful against this. We have to be on guard against this perspective. I've talked to many people over the years, and and the ones that have went back into the world, um, they so often that happens prematurely. Well, it's always prematurely, obviously, but they but they're they're they haven't waited to see God play this situation out. They're being quick to judge how you know, how God's working in the situation and they don't see it. And we're all open to that. All of us can fall into this. And so, you know, he, he's discouraged. He's like, I have cleansed my heart in vain. We have never cleansed our heart in vain, ever. God's the one that cleanses our hearts, first of all. And it's pleasing to him that when he comes in and changes us from the inside out, it's the heart that God has the priority over. We think of so many outward things, but God looks at the heart and deals with the heart. And when he does that, then the result of that, what comes out of our mouths, what comes out of our, our motivations, what decision-making, all these things uh, are affected. So that's the part that, see, man-made religion is all about outward rituals and, and things that we do outwardly. God's the one that's closely connected to our hearts and wants our hearts to change. So you see somebody that's mature here, he leads God's people in worship. He has a play, he's a Levite. He's called by God to lead God's people in worship, but yet he is being affected here and being deceived, coming to the wrong conclusion. So we can see clearly here the power of this deception. Verse 14, for all day long, I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. He's aware that he could say things that would stumble people and it wouldn't do any good anyway in his mind because the outcome is going to be the outcome. Verse 16, when I thought how to understand this, 
it was too painful for me. See, this is, the, this is the part that really needs to be tucked into our hearts, at least for the future, if not right now, with everything that's happening in this world. We have to fall back on what we do know about God when we have trouble with things that we don't know about God, especially with our own lives. There's so many things that we don't know the answer to, that I don't know the answer to. It's so funny when people come to me as a pastor and they think that I know every answer to every question that's in the scriptures and like, well, you haven't, obviously haven't talked to my wife because she'll t- definitely show you and tell you about things that I, I still know nothing about. And the most important thing is not head knowledge anyway, it's how we live it out. That should be the true test if we know something because to know it as far as God's concerned is to obey it, is to experience it. And, and so, um, you know, it, it, it can be really painful when we think about how these things need to be thought about because God cares how we think about things. It matters to him how we think about things. He's given us the laws of logic. The laws of logic are an evidence for God. The laws of logic are things that man discovers. He doesn't invent. He may label them and categorize them, but in the sense of the actual principles, that's an evidence of God's creation. It's an evidence for God. There's no natural explanation for the laws of logic. And so, so he says, it's too painful for me to think about these things. I can't reconcile them, and they're doing damage to me. And that's what we can see here. Even if Asaph didn't fully understand the implications of, of these things. They were having a really negative effect on him. So when we don't understand something, we have to fall back on what we do understand about God. And we may not have the full answer in this life. And that's okay. We may be able to come to him and ask him certain things in eternity. And, and I'm very confident we're going to have a sufficient answer and it's going to all make sense. See, this is the part that we forget. All of our lives are a tapestry. All of our lives are interconnected. We don't understand how, but they are. Every conversation we have, every interaction that we have is influencing somebody else and and where they're at in their journey with God. So we don't know why certain things happen. We don't know why certain decisions are made. We don't understand fully why God allows certain things. That's part of the mystery of wanting to know God more is to, to, to discover these things and learn these things and trust him. See, the virtue in, of faith is not believing and trusting God when you do understand. It's when you believe and trust God when you don't understand. And in the face of incredible incongruency where things just seem to not line up. There's a, there's a young boy um, in the valley that's struggling deeply with a disease, a cancer, and and everything, and I, my heart goes out to his mother, who just, I just get an unimaginable pain. I can't even imagine what she's gone through um, dealing with all of this. And but she looks at her son as an example of faith, and it just blows her mind how God is using this, not just in his life, but in other people's lives as they watch this young man, as they watch him trust God when it doesn't make sense, when it doesn't seem. To, to align why he would, God would allow this. But God tells us over and over in his word that he has, he's going to make everything right. He's going to restore everything. He's going to work through all of this. And this tapestry that he's weaving, we're going to look and go, you do all things well. And I, I don't understand how you did all this, but you did it. And so we want to honor the Lord through every situation. We want to recognize that we don't have all the answers. We can recognize that there's so much that we do know about him that we can trust him for in the face of not understanding. And that brings us great joy. Now, notice in verse uh, 17 through 20, he learns of God's perspective of the wicked. Look at verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Interesting. So he's saying, He's connecting proper perspective with the sanctuary. You know, and not everybody could go into the sanctuary at this time. This is the Jewish sanctuary. This is this is the temp the tabernacle. And this is the only the priest could could go into the sanctuary, and only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctuary there. 
But see, as believers, we have the Holy of Holies inside of us. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And, and so he's, that perspective changed when he went into the sanctuary of God. He got to see things from God's perspective. He doesn't itemize and list all the ways that while he was in the sanctuary, his perspective changed. He didn't need to. He doesn't need to because we know that that's between him and the Lord. But God did it. God changed his perspective because he says, then I understood their end. So it's not a matter of what's the most important thing that he's learning here. It's not really about what they're going through right now. That's the important thing because his perspective wasn't totally off at all. I mean, they were, they are, they were uh, experiencing these, these blessings and everything, and they were going through these things, but there's a timing to everything. God's willing that none should perish, but all come to repentance, and he's wooing people to himself. That time frame or that timeline isn't always in line with what we think the timeline should be. And so he says, I, I, I understood. I understood their end. There's an end to ungodliness. There's a finality to ungodliness. It leads somewhere. It leads to calamity. It leads to death. It leads to horrific things. And Asaph was uh, reminded of that. And again, someone that's mature, someone that's being used by God in ministry can have these type of perspectives be skewed until they come into the sanctuary of God. That's why on Sundays, uh, I really try hard and the leaders really try hard to make this the one place where you're not distracted with a bunch of temporal things. The one place where eternal things are prioritized and, and temporal things are ignored or minimized because this has to be a place where you have your eyes lifted up. I have my eyes lifted up on eternal things, things that will outlive the heavens and the earth, things that these truths and these wonderful things about God that will outlive creation. Verse 18, surely you set them in slippery places, talking about the wicked. You cast them down to destruction. Now in verse two, he said, my feet nearly slipped. But notice in this verse, he says that you set the wicked in slippery places and cast them down to destruction. See, that's the part that no one wants to, at least sinful man or unbelievers or people unfamiliar with scripture, they don't ever want to believe that God's going to judge sin. They just hate that idea. They hate the idea that God's going to judge sin, but he's going to judge sin. And, and we want sin to be judged when we've been a victim, right? We're all about justice then. We want justice. Give me justice. Let's say something really horrible happened to one of your family members, but the judge gave him community service you would say that judge needs to be disbarred. He's not a just judge. And we're appealing to a higher sense of justice that God himself stamped within us. And that's where we get our sense of justice. And so there is going to be a reckoning. There is going to be, I mean, if you can't ignore all the times Jesus talked about judgment and there is a judgment day, there's called something called the great white throne judgment in the book of Revelation. And all whose names were not found written in the Lamb's book of life were cast into the lake of fire. There was a final reckoning, a final judgment. No one, he doesn't force anyone to go to heaven. It's so funny when people get mad about the concept of eternal punishment that Jesus talked about, not us. He's the one that brought it up. When the, they, they don't want anything to do with God now, and so they want God to force them to go to heaven. You know, he honors our will. He honors what, what we want. If we don't want anything to do with him here, why would we think we want anything to do with him for eternity? So he says, you cast them down to destruction. Verse 19, oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with tears. This is the reality. He's in, being, now he's, I mean, he's, the whole time he's been inspired by God, but this, he's, he's laying out the exact truth here. They, will, they are brought down to desolation as in a moment. It doesn't happen gradually. There's a moment in time where they are judged and they are sentenced and that punishment is meted out. And he says, they are utterly consumed with terror. So they look great now. They're boasting. They have pride. They're wearing pride like a necklace. They are saying lofty things. They are uh, speaking against the heavens. They are, they are blaspheming and everything. 
But there'll come a day when that, that reckoning comes. And then he says, as a dream, when one awakes, so Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. So he, he's like, this is going to happen. This is going to happen in a moment in time. And, you know, God is forced to do this because of his nature. He is just. And again, we wouldn't have our sense of justice if God wasn't just. We get that from him. So now the response to all this, Asaph worships in verses 21 through 28 there, but he begins with repentance, which is very fitting. Look at verse 21. Thus my heart was grieved and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Talk about honesty there. And that's the thing. We can be honest with God. We can be contrite. We can be so, you know, uh, revealing to him. He knows our hearts anyway. He knows what's in our minds and everything. And he says, my heart was greed. I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. And, and so he repents. He confesses his sin and everything, which is beautiful. God loves the repentant heart. He loves heart, hearts that are repentant. And if you're new to the Bible, the word repent means to change your mind. It's a change of mind that results in a change of direction. When you decide to go the opposite direction on a road and you do a U-turn, you know that you repented. You had a change of mind. Hopefully it's legal. Hopefully it's, you know, allowed. Uh, but, but he allows U-turns. He loves U-turns <laughs> in, in life, especially. And then he says, Verse 23, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand, just like a child. You hold me by my right hand. I'm continually with you. Now here starts the worship starts coming. He's repented. Now the worship starts coming. You will guide me with your counsel. And afterward, receive me to glory. Now notice he's saying all these things inspired by the Holy Spirit that, that is after he's already had the bad perspective. He's already doubted. He's already, um, you know, not valued the things that God has told him to do and basically saying, what's the point? And, and that just shows the grace of God, that God would be willing to do that. Never think that he's going to be harsh with you. Never think that he's going to be anything but gracious towards you. Again, he knows your, you better than yourself. He knows your shortcomings. He knew all of your sin before, before you were born, before, from eternity past. Jesus died for all the sins that we will ever commit. Even ones we haven't committed yet, he's already died for. He's already paid for. This makes us want to worship even more. But he has this gracious um, disposition towards Asaph here. And he says, you will be guide me with your counsel. So counsel isn't dependent upon if we are perfect and always having the right perspective. God always wants to bring counsel. He always wants to bring perspective. And, and he says, and afterward, receive me to glory. And that's our, as Christians, that's our uh, portion. That's what's coming. Again, we've seen the end of the book and God wins. That's what's coming. And eternal life starts now. Once we receive Christ, once we are born again, we have that spiritual birth, eternal life starts right now. And I love the fact that he's so clear about that. Now, verse 25, he says, whom I have heaven but you, and there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. So he's thinking about all the things he doesn't have when he's struggling, all the things that these, the, the wicked have that he doesn't. He says he, he says he was envious. But now what's the most important thing? Because he went into the sanctuary, the most important thing to him is God himself. And that's ultimately why we are never going to be satisfied until we have God himself. Because that's who he made us to, to run on, so to speak. You know, um, if you put water in the gas tank of a car, at least the kind of cars that we are familiar with, um, it won't run because it's not designed to run on water. We weren't designed to run on anything other than a relationship with God. That's why before we have a true relationship with God, we are discontent. And we try one thing after another, with this and then that and then this and now we're into this and now we're into that. 34 years ago, when I received Christ, I had just finished another thing that I was into. And that's why the people that knew me and know me to, still today, they said, oh, that's a phase. You've been in so many phases. 
you've been into this and into that, and please don't tell me about Amway again, you know, but I'm so good at the circles, you know, I've been practicing the circles on the whiteboard. I remember I was at a, a restaurant and I got sucked into that again. I didn't know what it was. And then he's in my kitchen, drawing the circles again. I'm like, I can't take any more circles. I'm about to go make crop circles because this, these circles, but you're, you're into all this stuff and you just are yearning for something. You don't know what it is. That's, as it's been said, there's a God-sized void in each one of our hearts. And until God comes in and fills that void, we're going to be empty. We're going to be seeking. We're going to be groping after significance and fulfillment and peace and all these things. That ends when we come to know Christ. He comes in and fills us and over, overflows us. And there's nothing that we're looking for. There's nothing else to find. That's why Peter said, you know, where are we to go? You have the words of eternal life. We can't go any better than the Lord and him coming inside of us and changing us. And it's a beautiful thing. So he says, who am I, who have I in heaven, but you, and there is none upon earth that I desire besides you, Jesus plus nothing equals contentment, contentment. And, and you, the more we walk with Christ, the more we realize that's true. Verse 26, my flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It's true. It's so temporal. But in this life is so small. You ever seen Francis Chan? You should look on YouTube for this. Francis, just put Francis Chan rope. He has this video, this sermon, these, this visual, uh, visual sermon that he does where he has this long rope and he paints the end of the rope red. And he says, this part of the rope here is your life right now. And the rest of the rope is eternity. But you spend and I spend all this time on What's going to happen here? What am, how am I going to retire? How am I going to, you know, all these things that we're so fixated on and focused on and no one's thinking about the rest of this rope, but we have to think about it. And God's is whatever he's doing in our lives is preparing us for eternity. He's preparing those things. And so he says, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Verse 27, for indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. And he's talking about spiritual harlotry. You know, the, the Jews, I mean, I'm telling you, <laughs> the Jews didn't, in, weren't, didn't inspire the Old Testament. It wasn't man writing it alone. God inspired them. Why do I know that? Because you would never write something and have yourself look so bad if you were going to make it up. And, and the, the, the Jews had this cycle. You can, as you study the Old Testament, you start seeing this cycle of them being right with God, then serving, compromising and serving idols, then being um, judged by God, and, then by, and a lot of times using their enemies to judge them. Then they cry out to God and repent. God takes them back, and the cycle starts again. And we can get all huffy and puffy and arrogant about that. What do you mean? How can you possibly do this? I mean, how can, I can't believe you would do this cycle. And then we realize, oh, that's a picture of the Christian life. I do that. Yeah, that's my life. That's, that's what I do. And, and, and he's saying, this is, this is, it's, it's a blessing to, to be able to, to, to draw close to him. And we can commit harlotry and, and, and God's very a, a jealous God, but he's saying you, they, they desert you have uh, for harlotry for something they thought was better. Or we were missing out on that was outside of what God allows. And that's what sin is. Something I think is best for me. And I should be able to do it, but it's really destructive because um, sin is not uh, bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad and it's destructive. Like a two-year-old reaching for the stove. That two-year-old doesn't understand how he's going to get burned, how she's going to get burned. But the parent knows. And we, we don't realize often what this is going to do in our lives, the implication of what, what's going to happen there. And God does. And so we have to trust him. Again, trusting what we what we don't know by what we do know about him. Verse 28, he closes, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. It is good to draw near to God. That's the solution to everything in our lives. That's the solution to unbelievers for them to receive Christ. 
become saved. That's the solution for as believers when we're struggling to draw near to God. It's really simple. And I need things simple. I don't know about you, but I need things really simple. And God just comes in and he's like, it's like a little kid when you, have, you hold their head so they're looking at you the whole time. And God comes in and says, just draw near to me. Just draw near to me. But so often that's the last thing that we do. And we, and, and we do everything else but draw close to God. He said, that's good for us to do that. And he says, I have put my trust in the Lord God. That's what faith is. Faith is trust. And he calls us to trust him, even in the face of things when we don't understand. That's the whole job of us as believers, ministering to other believers. How can I get them to trust God more? How can I get them to honor God by by their faith? Jesus marveled by faith. He was amazed by faith. All through the gospels, you see it. And, And of all the people who should excel in faith, it should be us because we have such history with God in terms of the church for 2,000 years and in God's people before that. And so he says there, the result though, at the end of verse 28, that I may declare all your works. See, God always intends for us when he's done a work in us, for us to not hold it back, to declare his works, to declare the truth about God. That's why he knows nothing about silent Christians. It was that saying, you know, preach the gospel and if necessary, need, use words. And I I understand that saying, we should be living it out. We should be examples, of course. But there comes a time when we have to open up our mouth and preach that gospel. Paul wrote, he says, without faith is impossible to please God. But he says, how can they hear unless a preacher is sent? How how, how can, you know, it's beautiful people that bring the, the, uh, the gospel of good news. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The context of that is the gospel. I know God's word brings faith, but the gospel is is the key. So there has to come a point in time when we actually open our mouth and share the good news of the gospel. And we're we're always surprised at at, at the response. Usually we think that they're not going to have a good uh, response to the gospel, but usually they have a good response. If we do it right, if we do it in love, we do it appropriately, we do it spirit directed, all those things. And we love, love them as we, as we are working with the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit gets behind that gospel, like nobody's business and convicts them of sin and, and shows them of their need. So beautiful Psalm, uh, just really sense that we should lift. He wants to lift our heads this morning, give us his perspective. uh, And um, I, I trust it was a blessing. It was a blessing to me. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for this psalm. Thank you for Asaph, for his honesty. Thank you that your Holy Spirit led him to record this for us. And I pray for all of us here in this room. Lord, would you lift our heads? Would you help us to have your perspective? Help us to keep our eye on the ball, so to speak, and and focused on the right things. Lord, you know how our, our hearts are. We can get our eyes off of the right things and onto the wrong things. I pray that you'd encourage your people today and, and, and fill them with your spirit, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and your grace, and we thank you for your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.